So anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Miller from Sonos to review the Beam product with us. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, hopefully everyone is able to log in okay and, uh, and see the screen. Uh, if you have issues, please uh, uh, just put it in the chat box and let Rick know and uh, we'll hopefully take care of that. Uh, so today, a quick little agenda um, that we're going to cover today is obviously, as Rick mentioned, we'll definitely be uh, getting in depth with the Beam uh, to understand what that product is, uh, what applications you can use it for, and where it makes sense in your overall solution sets. Um, as well, we will get into some additional you know, topics regarding our voice strategy uh, and how we're you know, progressing along that timeline, as well as uh, initiatives uh, to also integrate Sonos with additional products, uh, uh, you know, including lighting controls and uh, hard button you know, controls such as Sonance. So we will cover uh, some of the works with Sonos partners. Um, and then lastly, we'll actually dive into some technical information, uh, particularly around best practices for Sonos networking. That's a very common topic uh, in all of my travels, um, you know, working with integrators that uh, are deploying Sonos and their rack systems or they're you know, using them in uh, single uh, unit deployments, um, you know, understanding the best practices around networking and Wi-Fi and, and how to configure for the best results. So. Uh, hopefully that will be of value to you, um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, you see my contact inf information on there. Um, I cover six states, uh, including Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Western PA. Uh, been with Sonos about five years uh, and specifically focused on what we call the installed solutions channel. Uh, so lots of fun to work with Sonos uh, and exciting times are ahead. So. Uh, hopefully you'll you'll see some uh, really cool stuff today uh, and feel free to reach out with questions in the chat box and uh, we'll cover those at the end of the presentation. So first off, uh, just simply, you know, what, what is the mission of Sonos? And, and, you know, to do something simple is often quite hard. Uh, so we have a very simple tagline, um, all the music on earth in every room of your home wirelessly. And that's a mission we've been on since 2002. And it's uh, something that drives every decision that we make in terms of product design, uh, how we think about software, how we think about app control, uh, and the overall user experience. And that's one thing that I think has set Sonos apart uh, pretty much from day one, uh, is that we've been very focused on that user experience uh, to make sure that it's seamless, uh, easy, and non-intimidating. Uh, and so, um, you know, to boot uh, with more music services than any other platform, over 80 to date, uh, we give you you know, basically all the music on earth, uh, from whatever you want to listen to, from whether uh, you're into jazz or classic rock or anything, uh, we have a music service uh, hosted on Sonos that will fulfill that need. One of the things that we've been really focused on in terms of experience in the last year has been voice control. And so, as I'm sure you're all aware, you've seen the momentum of uh, products like Amazon Alexa uh, that has really transformed the marketplace in terms of how we interact with our technology. And we actually really, really studied this uh, as we thought about our voice strategy to understand how we can, you know, integrate that into Sonos uh, and make it in a way that, you know, again, was not confusing or intimidating. And so we call it humanizing home audio because, you know, if you're going to be talking to your technology, what what, what easier way to, is there to control it than actually speaking to it? That's the most human response possible. Uh, and we took it a step further because we didn't want it to be um, you know, confusing in terms of setup or in actual operation. So I'm sure most of you have, um, you know, tested or have experimented with Amazon Alexa in your own homes, or perhaps you have customers that are experimenting with it and beginning to use it daily. Uh, you've probably seen skills out there that uh, sometimes they are, uh, you know, less than ideal because they have very complex uh, statements that you have to remember just to trigger a simple on command. Uh, and so we took that a step further by really integrating voice in a way that we feel is very natural, um, that doesn't require you to remember a specific syntax that, you know, just as simple as making a conversational statement, like saying, Alexa, play jazz in the kitchen. What's more natural than that? That's how two human beings would talk to each other. And that's how we really focused on our voice integration. So you'll see that evolve over time, and you'll see that uh, our voice uh, continues to, to really drive uh, simplicity in the product. So last fall, uh, as part of that voice strategy, we launched Sonos One uh, in November of 2017. 
And at that time, we actually had Amazon Alexa built right into the product. So um, the ability to control your music uh, with the simple sound of your voice is a game changer because now we don't have to pull out that app and you know put our thumbprint on it to uh, to get it to wake up or put in a passcode. We can just talk to our speaker and actually have it play music, uh, you know, directly from the speaker itself. So uh, at launch, Amazon Alexa was built in. However, our, our voice strategy is not to limit ourselves to just Amazon Alexa. We intend to be agnostic, much like we are with music services. So if you can imagine, uh, you know, having the ability, uh, you know, at some point down the road here to actually integrate with perhaps Amazon Alexa or Google uh, or perhaps Siri and have your choice of voice assistants. That's a very powerful uh, capability in our platform. Uh, that's something that's uh, not really being focused on by other vendors. And we believe in giving you a choice. And so you can use either or uh, or both. Uh, and you can choose who you want to date in terms of your voice assistant. So uh, very powerful. And, and that development is ongoing with Google. Uh, so you will see uh, announcements later on uh, that you know, give you that capability to a simple software update. And again, that really drives home something that Sonos has always been known for is it gets better over time. So the ability to add that without any additional uh, dollar investment is, is pretty pretty awesome. So with Alexa, what can we do? Uh, not only play your music, um, you know, via that Sonos speaker, that Sonos one that may be located in your kitchen or your hallway, uh, you can simply, you know, make uh, simple statements such as, uh, okay, play jazz in the kitchen or okay, play uh, David Bowie in the bedroom uh, and be more specific right down to uh, artist title and track. Uh, so very specific depending on what music services you have set up. Uh, it's very powerful. So if you have not uh, you know, currently used Alexa with Sonos, I encourage you to, uh, to set it up uh, and actually start experimenting with it because uh, I certainly use it every day and not just for music, but also for um, the wide range of Alexa skills that are out there. So uh, voice is certainly going to become a part that, of the, the, the future. Yes. Yes. Um, we're getting some feedback that the slides are being cut off on the right side. Like specifically right now, the black window that says OK playing is uh, like the last half of it is probably cut off. Hmm. OK. That may just be on this slide, the transitions are cutting off. So hopefully uh, if you see that anymore, uh, please let me know. Um, it may just be on the transition slide. OK. Let's see. So, uh, you know, beyond just, uh, you know, this, the, the ability to control music, you will have the ability to control, um, you know, things like flash briefings or your weather reports, uh, all those you know, amazing Alexa skills that are out there and growing by the day. Uh, just to make sure, Rick, uh, were you seeing this one full screen? No, it's definitely cut off. It looks like it's doing four by three and a 16 by nine. Pause the presentation here for a minute. And okay. Great. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, no problem. We'll get this resolved. I didn't recognize it because I had my all my diagnostics were on that side of the screen, so it was cut off anyway. Second here. There we go. For better? Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks, Matt. My apologies, everybody, for that. A little split screen madness there. So uh, <laughs> hopefully things will go smoothly. Uh, so one of the things with you know the Alexa control is that uh, we don't um, we can control not just the speaker that you're speaking to. So if you have a Sonos one in the kitchen, we can control any other speaker around the home. So if you have a play bar in the den or a play five in the bedroom, uh, you could simply 
send that music request, such as play jazz in the bedroom, uh, from the Sonus One in the kitchen to the bedroom. Okay, so any other speaker that is actually on that uh, that particular network or household uh, can be controlled via the, the one voice-enabled speaker that's located in the kitchen. Uh, so very powerful uh, and simply gives you the flexibility of not having to use the app all the time and yet being able to control your music from anywhere in the home. So this leads us into a product that we uh, just announced about three weeks ago uh, called the Sonos Beam. And the Sonos Beam represents um, about two and a half years of development for Sonos. And this is a, a product that falls you know, directly into the home theater category, uh, designed to work with your TV, uh, but we call it the smart compact soundbar for your TV. Uh, and just to set expectations, right, because I've heard from a number of dealers that have uh, some experience where they they think that this is a replacement for play bar. This is not a replacement for play bar. Uh, where you spec play bar today, you're going to spec play bar tomorrow. Okay. Where Beam fits in is in those auxiliary rooms, and um, the Sonos Beam uh, with voice integration built in uh, is going to give you that nice to have functionality with immersive sound uh, that fits into those auxiliary rooms. Think so. Think think of dens, bedrooms, offices, laundry rooms, garages, you name it, uh, being with a smaller form factor uh, and its compact design uh, and you know, a aesthetic appeal will fit into any of those spaces. So uh, really you know, look at applications for Beam where you may not have been selling audio before, now you have an opportunity to capture uh, at a lower price point in a smaller compact uh, form factor. So whether it's in the, the living room or the kitchen, uh, again, a smaller you know, design uh, and yet still room filling sound is going to give you a nice application to put it on those smaller TVs that perhaps uh, were just being used with the TV speakers themselves in the past. And uh, now we have an option to actually uh, give better sounding uh, TV audio as well as music because just like Play Bar, uh, when the TV goes off, now it becomes your audio system for that space. So Beam is really designed for that uh, type of application. And I think what you'll find is that uh, you'll have an opportunity to upsell uh, in those particular solutions where um, you know audio was pr probably not being uh, you know considered in, in the previous uh, installations. Again, compact design. So if you look at the beam, uh, you know it's clearly designed to be uh, placed on furniture, uh, but it also does include um, or have optionally a wall mount where you can mount it on the wall if the TV is mounted on the wall. Uh, one of the nice things about Beam that I've found, um, I've had it in my home now for about three months, is that, uh, you know, with its choice of color, uh, it really blends into my lifestyle. So, you know, having it in my office, uh, I actually chose the white one because it blended in better with my you know, surroundings. And it looks modern and sleek, uh, but not obtrusive. So I didn't feel like it was overpowering or, uh, or standing out in my particular, you know, office decor. So, uh, you know, a, a different uh, aesthetic you know, than the play bar, uh, but I think the smaller form factor really will be an appeal in the smaller spaces where play bar might have been a little bit of an overkill. Uh, it's also really designed, you know, at the outset to be a product that can stand on its own. So uh, while it can be paired with a sub or even surrounds for doing full 5.1 Dolby Digital, uh, it is uh, fully capable of providing very immersive sound just by itself. Um, it actually has a five speaker design, so there are uh, four full range drivers. You have two on either end, left and right, uh, that are angled at 45 degrees, which gives you uh, amazing presence and just overall dispersion uh, in the space. So you're going to definitely hear uh, when you're watching movies, um, you know, some stimulated surround that's going to give you, uh, you know, a, a very awesome experience. Uh, and then when you're playing music, those front facing uh, electrical drivers are going to give you a really good vocal presence, uh, just well overall depth. Uh, so it's a really amazing amount of um, audio presence that comes out of a speaker in this compact design. It's actually 60% smaller than Play Bar. Uh, each driver is actually driven by its own Class D digital amp, uh, and those other two full range whoopers are on either side of the Sonos product tag. Uh, in the center is actually a uh, single tweeter uh, that gives you a really good high end. Uh, but yet not tinny uh, sounding, so it's a very good depth uh, and just overall uh, good, clear, crisp uh, audio experience. 
And then as well, there's actually three passive radiators. These help drive some low end, uh, so you will get some good uh, base resonance out of this speaker just by itself, uh, so much so that you don't feel necessarily that you have to add a sub to it. So in those smaller rooms, uh, sometimes a sub would be overkill, and if you look a lot of, at a lot of competing products, you'll find that uh, they're always trying to uh, attach that sub uh, to really fulfill uh, what the speaker cannot deliver on its own. And so with Beam, we really designed this to be a standalone speaker, uh, but yet with the option to add uh, a sub or uh, rear surrounds for a more fuller experience. Uh, three passive radiators, two on the front, one on the rear, uh, will drive some good low end. Uh, and again, this can be mounted to the wall, in which case uh, that passive radiator on the back will help drive some additional base. In the back is a small cable cove. So that's where your uh, interconnects will be uh, for power, uh, audio in, and ethernet. Uh, it is recessed, so when it is mounted on the wall, it's easy to snug those uh, cables in uh, without crimping or, uh, or damaging the cables themselves. And then lastly is that we have a uh, heat sink with an integrated antenna. And like all Sonos products, one thing that we pride ourselves on is that uh, we build our power supplies into the product itself. So you don't have any clunky wall warts or external power supplies that uh, always take up space uh, and are very difficult to, uh, to hide and provide a really clean installation. So the uh, power supply is built in. It's a simple uh, power cord that goes into the back, very sleek and, uh, and modern design that's um, you know, sim simple to install. On the bottom that you can't see here are two threaded mounts. That's where the actual um, uh, bracket mounts uh, to the beam itself, and then the bracket mounts to the wall. So one of the things that uh, is, is unique about Beam that you'll notice is that first off, it does not have an optical in. Uh, this is our first product with HDMI. Uh, and so we actually designed this with HDMI arc for audio return channel. And most modern generation TVs now include an arc port. So you're watching that Netflix client uh, on your smart TV and you're gonna feed that uh, via the HDMI arc uh, back into the beam for audio return channel. Uh, it does allow us to do some intriguing things. So we can actually you know, interface because HDMI arc is a two-way connection. So the beam can talk to the uh, TV and the TV can talk back to the beam so they understand their states. Uh, through, so through consumer electronics control, we can understand the states of the TV and vice versa. Uh, so it does allow us to simplify some of the uh, you know, the remote programming. So instead of, you know, clunky IR codes that uh, may toggle TV on and off or toggle an input that switches it to the wrong input and then you know, the customer is frustrated, uh, HDMI ARC uh, through CEC can allow us to maintain synchronization and give us a more seamless experience in terms of control. Uh, however, there are TVs, uh, certainly, you know, from several years ago that did not have uh, HDMI ARC ports on them. So with that, we actually included in an optical audio adapter, which is simply an HDMI in, or I'm sorry, an optical uh, from the TV to an HDMI female that interfaces with the supplied uh, HDMI cable in the box. So every beam comes with this adapter. So if you wish to interface just like the play bar via optical, then you have that choice. Uh, that adapter uh, is custom designed for the beam um, and is only available um, as part of the, the beam sale. So. Uh, it is included in the box, and uh, for those older TVs, or if you just simply find that a TV is not compatible or it's not working well with HDMI ARC, uh, then this is your uh, your plan B uh, safety net to use the optical audio adapter that's included. Uh, I happen to use this in my demos because I have a smaller TV that does not have HDMI ARC and it works flawlessly. So uh, simple connectivity to a, uh, to a six foot included HDMI cable in the box. Uh, as well, we have a standard Ethernet port on the back, so designed to be used wirelessly, but however, you can hardwire it in. Uh, obviously, uh, cable or power cord connection, and then the pairing button on the back is simply for setting it up. Uh, one other thing that's actually included in the Beam that uh, is a little bit different from Sonos of past is that we actually include Bluetooth Low Energy. All right? So Bluetooth Low Energy is not used for streaming. We still use Wi-Fi. Uh, always have, always will, uh, because Wi-Fi gives a better experience. It allows us that multi-room control, uh, as well as the higher audio quality. Bluetooth Low Energy is used for simplicity of pairing up. So, for example, you can um, you know, discover that device, and instead of connecting to you know, a, a temporary uh, Sonos network that the product sets up to connect for the Wi-Fi credentials, uh, Bluetooth Low, Low Energy allows your Android or iOS device to simply uh, connect via BLE 
uh, and basically you know, shoot the, uh, the wireless credentials into the product and get it set up uh, even faster and easier than ever before. So that's what we use Bluetooth Low Energy for. It's not used for uh, streaming, and that is not uh, uh, supported in the product. It's only used for uh, the ability to set it up and, uh, and uh, make the experience a little bit smoother. Uh, on the top of the product, you actually see that there's an array uh, of the, uh, the capacitive touch controls that we introduced on the Play 5 several years ago uh, and carried over into the, uh, the Playbase and the Sonos One, uh, where simple taps on the top of the speaker will actually increase or decrease your volume. You have your play pause in the center. Uh, and then you also have a microphone mute button, uh, which similar to the Sonos One will actually disable that microphone when you want to have privacy if you're using it on Alexa or any other voice assistant. Uh, there is an array of five microphones into the top of the speaker. So those are designed such that even at full volume uh, from across the room when you're sitting in a couch, you can actually control the product via Amazon uh, or any other voice assistant uh, without having to lower that volume. So we designed that uh, in a way that it's uh, reliable uh, and will work at uh, even full volume. So today, uh, Amazon Alexa is built in, uh, just like Sonos One, it works the same way. Uh, with HDMI ARC, we can do some intriguing things, such as we can actually uh, control and uh, interface with the TV. So we can do things like saying, you know, watch TV, we'll actually turn on the TV and send that on off command through the uh, beam straight to the TV. So it switches to the right input uh, and you can blend begin playing your content. If you have additional uh, devices such as an Amazon Fire TV, you can even go all the way from uh, you know, zero with everything off to 60 um, and watching a movie by simply saying, you know, Alexa, watch Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, and by enabling the Alexa skill on the Fire TV, uh, that one command will trigger everything from an off state all the way to on to playing the actual movie. And that's really powerful once you set that up. Uh, I use that almost every day, uh, and it makes it super simple for me to uh, to play my movies and interact with my content or even search for content via the uh, the Alexa voice commands. So all without having to navigate menus or you know pick up a remote control, which is really powerful. So we at Sonos believe that uh, you know by listening better, we're going to live better, and we believe that the Beam, uh, with a small form factor and just really rich immersive sound. Uh, enables us to just live better because it's less confusing, a better experience overall, uh, easy for customers to understand uh, and interact with the product either via voice or via the, uh, via the Sonos app uh, and control you know, not only their, uh, their movie content, but when the TV's off, the, the music content uh, with over, over 80 music services available for them to, uh, to tap from. Uh, and then lastly, the beam is designed to be better over time. So like all of our Sonos products uh, that have been out there, sometimes in excess of five, six, even 10 years, uh, continuing to get software updates and add new features and functions and perhaps better audio quality uh, is a hallmark of Sonos. And that's something that we're gonna continue to drive. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned before with the voice technology, uh, the ability to add additional voice assistance in the future is very powerful and something that I believe sets us apart. Uh, as well as add you know, additional functionality for features, uh, one of which is coming uh, yet today, and that is actually AirPlay uh, to Sonos. So the ability to actually AirPlay to Sonos speakers. Uh, so I don't have a slide on this, but I want to just mention it, is that AirPlay functionality is going to come to select Sonos speakers uh, via software update. And this is AirPlay version two, which has actually been recently released by Apple. And what this allows us to do is, for example, take uh, any iOS device and effectively AirPlay it, much like you would to an Apple TV, except that you will just send that audio straight to a Sonos speaker. So imagine watching a YouTube video on your on your iPad and then actually directing that audio uh, in perfect synchronization over to a Sonos One, where you're going to have a way better audio experience than you would on that uh, on that uh, that laptop speaker. So. Uh, really powerful, but not only you know a YouTube video, but anything uh, that you want to direct in terms of audio from that iOS device. So imagine you know uh, you're watching or you're listening to Apple Music uh, via the Apple Music app on that iOS device, and instead of opening the Sonos app, you just want to direct it to the Sonos speaker. So via AirPlay, you'll be able to do that, uh, and that's very powerful. And and uh, 
and quite functional. I've been using it in my house for a couple months now, and I find it really, really helpful, um, particularly when I you know, want to show a YouTube video, but I don't want to have to navigate that on a TV. I can do it simply on my iOS device and, uh, and send the audio to something that's going to sound way, way better. So uh, AirPlay coming as a free software update. Now, only select speakers actually have um, the appropriate hardware to support AirPlay V2. Uh, so that starts with the Play 5 Gen 2 that was released in 2015, uh, continues with the Playbase, uh, the Sonos One, and now the Beam. All right. Now, if you have additional products such as a Connect Amp or a Connect, uh, as long as you had one of the compatible products, uh, such as a Beam or a Sonos One, then you could AirPlay to either of those products and then you can group in uh, the other products. So if you had a Connect uh, or a Connect Amp that was driving some in-ceiling spe speakers in the kitchen, and then you had a Sonos One in the hallway, as long as you AirPlay to the Sonos One and then group the, uh, the Connect Amp to it, uh, you're going to hear that audio over both of those speakers. So uh, really options, uh, a lot of options there to uh, to make AirPlay a part of your uh, installations and give your customer better, you know, customers better experiences. So kind of transitioning now, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about what works with Sonos. So this is a program that we started several years ago, uh, and we're continuing to add to the, uh, the number of companies that now have integrations with Sonos. So uh, one of the big ones that we've had for a number of years, and it's, it's really great partnership, is Lutron. So you know, the ability to actually blend uh, you know, lighting and sound is uh, you know, just incredibly powerful because it, sometimes you aren't doing those full-blown control systems and you want to do some uh, light automation. So if it's just a couple of you know, scenes where you have some lights uh, and some shades that uh, interact with Sonos where you can trigger some dinner music when the, uh, the lights go down to 60% and the shades go up uh, or shades go down, then you, know, you can program that in the Lutron app and actually configure that scene or even some geofencing where when you come home, it will configure that automatically. So Really simple to set up, um, and then you can also use the Lutron Pico remote to actually control Sonos uh, via hard button. So if you, again, don't want to use that uh, that app or your phone isn't convenient, then you can actually use the, uh, the Lutron Pico remote and pair that in uh, and be able to control a single zone of Sonos. So uh, really powerful stuff there um, and you know, very low cost and easy to set up, a great way to, uh, to interact with your customers. Uh, Logitech, uh, another one. Uh, obviously, you know, a very well-known brand name remote, particularly around single room control, but uh, you can use their app and actually control Sonos uh, as well um, you know, via a play bar or you know, a simple standalone product. Uh, great way to, to program in uh, Logitech control in addition to your Sonos system. Uh, another hard button control iPort uh, with the iPort Express uh, keypad. Uh, you know, it's a great way to interact with Sonos again when you know that app control is um, you know just not always convenient. Uh, you're walking in with a farm load of groceries and you want to you know just get the music going. Then that one button press on the uh, uh, on the keypad will get the music going, um, and you can raise and control that volume on that zone and uh, it can figure out how you how your clients need. Uh, uh, particularly for older clients, that makes a lot of sense because a lot of times uh, they may not be the best at using apps. So the list goes on. Uh, lots of other integrations, uh, certainly in the pipeline, but uh, you know, keep tabs on this because we're continuing to announce additional integrations and uh, and, and stronger ones with partners all the time. Uh, we really believe in an open platform that gives you the flexibility to control your web. So one thing that uh, I find in all of my travels and working with integrators is that. Uh, you know, I, I ask a question quite often in my trainings is that what music services are commonly set up uh, you know, when you do your installations? And the number one, you know, service I always hear is that uh, Pandora, you know, is always commonly set up. And yes, Pandora is awesome because it's uh, it's simple. It's fire and forget. You kind of you know, grab an artist or a song and you just let it go and you don't have to worry about it again. But I really implore you to discover all of the music services that Sonos has to offer. Uh, over 80 worldwide, 40 here in the U.S., uh, and half of those music services are entirely free. So please take time to, uh, to really discover what's out there. Uh, 100,000 free you know, internet radio stations via TuneIn, iHeartRadio, uh, you know, podcasts. Uh, there's so much rich content out there that you can find that um, you know, is just uh, amazing for customers to find. And, and I think it really 
you know, adds to the value of what they see Sonos uh, is in their household. So take the time to really educate them on that. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, if you're, if you're training them, then that should be billable time. Uh, but I think they will really reward you in the, in the long run to make sure that, you know, they're, they're getting the most out of the systems that have been set up. So uh, a couple of ones that uh, I find that are really unique are SoundCloud. Um, this is all the content you never hear on the radio. Uh, independent artists and so forth that uh, are just getting started and don't really have uh, you know, much commercial presence. Uh, SoundCloud, you can really find those uh, needle in a haystack artists that uh, have some really good content that uh, is good to listen to. Uh, and it's totally free. They do have a subscription base, but they have a, uh, a free version as well. So. Check some of these out. Um, you know, we're constantly adding new ones and tweaking others, so uh, definitely check out all that we have to offer. Uh, one of the things that uh, we released actually a little over a year and a half ago was the ability to uh, you know, have direct control of Sonos via Spotify. Uh, and not just Spotify, but you'll actually find that with other services as well. We're continuing to add more direct control partners. Uh, so today that's Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, um, but that list will grow over time. And uh, it, essentially, it's another way of, of controlling your way. So if you're jamming all day on your Spotify app and you're going around town and you come home and you want to continue to use your Spotify app and still jam at home on your Sonos, then you can actually go into that Spotify app, hit the devices available, and you'll see all of your Sonos speakers available to, uh, to target. And then you can start listening on, uh, on one or more of those speakers and uh, never leave that Spotify app. So. Uh, again, another way that um, you know we, Sonos gets better over time. You know, these are coming as software updates that give you more functionality. So definitely uh, take time to educate your customers about you know, what is uh, possible with direct control, and uh, I think they'll really, really be happy that they have uh, options for controlling their system via voice, uh, direct control, the Sonos app, or uh, uh, or even hard button. And premium services. So uh, we support uh, uh, any number of premium music services. So one of the biggest here is uh, Apple Music, obviously uh, very well known brand name. Uh, Apple Music can only be played on Sonos or you know a Apple product or via Bluetooth to another product. But that's not a very good experience. Uh, the ability to have that hosted directly on Sonos is really a testament to our relationship with Apple and uh, how we feel about you know, giving a uh, an awesome experience for the customer. So. Uh, it simply adds like any other service, just put your credentials in, uh, and then it's available as a uh, as a service on Sonos, uh, just like you would access Google or anything else. Uh, all of these are subscription services. They have um, you know, plans ranging from five to fifteen dollars a month, uh, but great way for those customers to uh, go beyond Pandora and actually get on-demand music from you know libraries that you know, typically exceed thirty million tracks. So, uh, great solutions. Um, for people that really want to explore their music interest. So we're going to jump a little bit out of music services, and we're going to talk some about some technical information, uh, specifically to uh, Sonos best practices. So uh, just a little review here, and I think for most of you that have done any type of network in the past are aware of this, but just want to kind of give you a review. So some of the wireless to audio technologies that have been out there in the past are, you know, things such as AirPlay uh, or Bluetooth. Um, where you know they are wireless technologies, yes, okay, but you know fundamentally different from each other. And one of the things with Apple AirPlay that's always been kind of an Achilles heel is that uh, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you know you have your source device and then you have your target device, and you know it's it's not ideal for a multi-room system um, because you know typically you want to listen to different music in different rooms, and it's very limiting in that regard. Uh, Bluetooth is similar because you have that one-to-one -one relationship. Your source device, whether your phone or your iPad, becomes the server. So if it runs out of battery, then party's over, right? Um, if the uh, if you walk th more than 30 feet away because Bluetooth is a low-range you know, wireless technology, then party's over. Or if you get a phone call, then the whole party gets the phone call. So that's not a very good experience, and that's one of the reasons we have not. Uh, adopted Bluetooth as a streaming medium. Uh, and then lastly, it's a it's a compressed stream because the bandwidth on Bluetooth is far less than Wi-Fi is. So um, we have always used Wi-Fi uh, simply because it provides a better experience, better quality, and gives us more capacity to do more things um, in terms of multi-room music control. So one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at Sonos is that we have 
what we call SonosNet. And SonosNet is a mesh network uh, design that's been in Sonos pretty much from day one uh, that allows the products to talk to each other. Um, it uses fundamentally 802.11, uh, but you know, in a proprietary way that allows it to create its own mesh network. So instead of a hub and spoke type you know, arrangement where you have an access point uh, and you have your products talking to that access point, uh, SonosNet allows us to create a mesh network where they talk to each other dynamically. So they will figure out a route uh, from one another back to the, uh, uh, the internet that allows them to stream uh, very reliably. And so as you add more products, you actually increase the strength of that mesh network because they will have more paths to uh, choose from and maintain you know, solid uh, you know, signal and connectivity. So it is based on uh, 802.11n uh, and it uses AEM for encryption, so it's very secure. Uh, and effectively allows you to hardwire one or more products and then you can use the rest of them wirelessly. So uh, a very convenient way of setting up Sonos uh, in a wireless way, particularly if you're doing a retrofit, where you may not have the luxury of running Ethernet to every location uh, of the products where they are located. So Sonos Net 2.0 uh, has been a hallmark of Sonos and has really driven the adoption uh, of the system to make it easy to set up and, uh, uh, and configure. So every, every product is a transmitter and receiver. So it's all dynamic, nothing you have to configure other than actually adding products. They will figure out their own routes and paths and uh, configure, the, configure themselves dynamically as the, uh, as the environment changes. One of the products that really help that Sonos Net uh, configuration is the Boost. Uh, and the Boost is typically used uh, really as that first wire product because oftentimes the uh, the network is such that the cable modem or the router may be located in a cabinet or somewhere that's um, not, not easily uh, accessible by a speaker or a connector or a connect amp. So the boost can be that first wire product. It basically hardwires into the router. And then everything from that point, you know, from that point forward becomes uh, you know, part of Sonos Net. So it just creates that mesh network. And then the, uh, the boost actually uh, is the one hardwired piece um, you know, that connects to the, uh, the router itself. So I'm sure most of you have um, uh, you know, seen the Boost or used it in your installations. Uh, I have a number of dealers that I know that uh, they spec one at every single job simply because it is that utility piece that makes it really easy to add product later on. Even if they are hardwiring products in the rack, they put that Boost in there so they can add a wireless piece later on. Uh, so first off, networking first steps. Um, one of the things that we want to do when we you know, start a Sonos network is really scan for what else is out there. Because we are a wireless technology based on 802.11n, we use 2.4 gigahertz, uh, and we want to make sure that we're not intruding on or you know, competing with uh, a lot of wireless networks. And we all know how many wireless networks are out there. There's a ton. You do a scan, you'll probably come up with 20 just in you know, any typical household that are in the neighborhood. So we want to make sure that we're uh, you know, obviously operating on the least congested channel. So a number of tools that you can use, either via laptop or via Android phones, that, um, or even iOS to some extent, uh, you know, to scan for those wireless networks that are in the area and actually choose the, uh, the best channel um, on the least, congested, um, the least congested channel for the uh, for environment that you're in. So uh, we had a uh, release about two and a half years ago that allows us to actually create uh, a different setup uh, scenario for Sonos, uh, Sonos on Wi-Fi. Now, one thing I want to make you guys aware of is that Sonos on Wi-Fi is really designed for um, those more simple setups where maybe you're doing a, uh, a Sonos One or a Play One or a couple of standalone products, maybe a couple of Play Fives um, that you know, are typically located in the center of the home and they're you know, easily accessible to the, to the Wi-Fi signal. Uh, and perhaps this is where you know, they're using more of a consumer grade router, you know, something that's very you know, common in a smaller home or apartment or condominium. Sonos on Wi-Fi is great because it allows a customer to get set up very quickly. Um, there is no wired connection required. Uh, so you don't have to use a boost or anything. You basically use the products, power them up, and configure them for the Wi-Fi network that's already present in the home. Uh, it may not be the best solution if you're wishing to scale this up. Uh, so if you told me that you were going to install 10 connect amps in a rack, I would definitely recommend that you're, uh, you're gonna hardwire those into a switch. So uh, just be you know, clear about what the expectations of Sonos on Wi-Fi are. 
it's only as good as the Wi-Fi network itself, right? So if the Wi-Fi is poor uh, in that particular environment, it's an older router, um, that may not be the best solution. Um, so we're at the mercy of how good that Wi-Fi coverage is. Uh, and if there's a dead spot, then that's not going to be a good placement for a Sonos speaker. Uh, the other option is a dedicated Sonos network. So this is, uh, you know, leveraging Sonos Net where we actually hardwire one or more products. Um, uh, the Boost being a, a very common first wire product um, to start the network. Um, so this is going to give you the benefit of having, you know, all the Sonos pieces talk to each other and actually create a separate network from Wi-Fi that is not subject to uh, dead spots or it's not subject to just overall traffic on Wi-Fi. You know, if a customer had one uh, you know, Wi-Fi router, um, say a Linksys, you know, stuffed in a cabinet somewhere, and then the kids come home and they all start streaming Netflix after five o'clock, and and boom, the network comes to a halt. Well, if Sonos is, you know, competing for that bandwidth, then it may uh, experience issues as well. So we want to make sure uh, we're just, you know, inventorying what uh, what's out there and make sure that we're you know, not uh, trying to overload that wireless network. If that's the case, it would be better off to go with the dedicated Sonos net. One of the questions that comes up quite often uh, is, do I use a managed or am I going to switch? Because uh, the price difference between managed and unmanaged is uh, narrowing, right? So we find that uh, products such as Luxel or Ubiquity or, uh, you know, even uh, Meraki or Ruckus, uh, you know, those, while still a little bit of a price premium, they are definitely coming down uh, in prices. So, you know, do we use a managed versus unmanaged switch? Sonos will work with either unmanaged or managed. The key is, is that we have to make sure that if you're using a managed switch, that we enable a protocol called spanning tree protocol. Okay, spanning tree protocol uh, is at the heart of the Sonos system. We'll make sure that we are using that, um, you know, and configuring the managed switch for spanning tree. So uh, in an unmanaged switch, it doesn't matter because unmanaged switch is not gonna inspect or look at those packets. It's just going to pass everything uh, uniformly. And so an unmanaged switch, you can hardwire those, you know, individual connect or connect amps that might be in the rack straight into the switch and life is good. Um, you could then trunk that switch into your upstream router and everything will, uh, work as expected. Um, if you're using a managed switch, just make sure that you actually enable spanning tree protocol. I know in a Luxel that comes out of the box by default now on all of their current switches. Uh, other products may differ, so just make sure that STP is enabled. So, wireless range and interference. Uh, we want to definitely, you know, survey for just the overall building type. So, if this is a standard residential home, lots of drywall, uh, you know, typical construction, um, then, you know, range is typically within that. 50 to 75 feet, sometimes further, just depends on the open floor design. Obviously, materials, furniture, uh, appliances, and other electronic devices can greatly affect that range, but uh, you know, definitely want to survey that and understand exactly where there may be potential for interference. So if you have a, a, a room full of appliances, big refrigerators, stone, tile walls, that's obviously going to be an impediment to a wireless signal strength. So just make sure that we're uh, evaluating that with the tools that you have to. Uh, to test wireless signal. Uh, a great tool to use, honestly, is your mobile phone because it typically is going to have the least wireless range of, you know, any device because it's battery operated and, uh, uh, you know, will not have a, an external antenna on it. So uh, that can be a great way to survey. If you can get access on your phone, then typically other products will uh, definitely be able to get signal as well. Uh, and when you're, you know, when we're setting up a, uh, a sort of network with food, um, you know, the, the ability to overcome those range issues is simply because if we have, um, you know, for example, a, a boost that's back in the, uh, in the den in a cabinet, uh, and we put a play five in the kitchen, you know, it will leapfrog from one to the other to create that Sonos network. Uh, and then it will provide, you know, additional range for a play five that may be located in the far corner, uh, over in the living room. All right. So. Uh, as we add more products, certainly it will increase uh, that range and density, and it gives additional paths for uh, that signal to travel. Uh, Sonos uses exclusively 2.4 uh, for streaming. All right, so one thing that not a lot of, not a lot of people know is that Sonos also uses 5 gig in some products 
uh, for home theater applications. So, for example, when you're playing a play bar and you have that surround going uh, to a couple of play ones used as rare surrounds, uh, as well as a subwoofer, uh, you know, all of that surround information as well as low frequency effects actually go over five gig radios um, uh, instead of two four. And that's to decrease the latency and maintain the audio video uh, synchronization. So uh, music streaming uh, and just overall, you know, content that comes via the internet or via local libraries or via your phone is actually going to traverse 2.4. And so in that sense, we only, um, you know, support three non-overlapping channels. So in 2.4, there's one, six, and 11. Uh, within the Sonos app, you can actually configure that uh, and identify what uh, channel Sonos is going to remain on. So uh, definitely, you know, as part of that network survey, understand what other networks are out there, what are operating at 2.4, and what channels they are operating on. So we want to make sure that, uh, for example, if the Wi-Fi network in the home is operating on channel one, that Sonos is set to six or 11. Okay. And I know in some cases you're going to have multiple access points. Uh, we just want to make sure that wherever the sun is located, the products are located, we're trying to stay uh, on the least congested channel um, in that particular zone. Uh, one of the things that we can do there is um, you know, on those access points is to disable auto channel. Okay, Most um, you know, standard access points will come out of the box set with auto channel, in which case they will survey. Um, you know, typically at startup and then, you know, at some random interval, they will survey the, uh, uh, the landscape to understand, you know, what other wireless networks are out there and they may choose a different channel uh, at any given time. And so the problem with that is, is that um, Sonos is going to stay static, right? So once it sets its channel or you set it manually in the app, it's going to stay on that channel until you change it again. It does not auto scan uh, after it's initially set up. So if we set, um, you know, those access points to auto, then, you know, we have the potential where it could actually, you know, step on to the channel that Sonos is actually operating on. And uh, that may happen when Sonos isn't actually functioning. So it may be at night. Uh, and then we have an issue because uh, now there's an interference with two uh, products operating on the same channel. So uh, it's best to set your access points to, to a static channel. And then you, ex you know exactly where they're going to stay and where Sonos is going to stay. So spinning free protocol. Um, this uh, I could go on for about three days on this, but uh, kind of try and explain it um, in, a, in a way that uh, hopefully will get you guys at least a, a basic education. So spinning tree protocol um, is a concept where uh, you have a device that has multiple interfaces. So in the case of a Sonos speaker, it actually has an Ethernet port as well as a wireless radio. And in some cases, you may install Sonos and you have um, you know, products that are installed in racks, uh, such as connect or connect amps. Uh, and the best practice there is to hardwire, you know, that product uh, directly into a switch port. So, you know, one switch port per Sonos device. Uh, but those radios are still on. And so what Spinning Tree Protocol does is it identifies that, hey, I've got two paths to the network. I have the wireless radio and I have the Ethernet. Which one do I go over? So it's going to always look at that uh, you know, environment and basically say, hey, I've got a better path over the wire and I'm going to go over the wire. But meanwhile, it's going to make sure that it blocks that wireless interface. So it's not sending it out twice. Uh, if it sends it out twice, we get a network loop. And uh, as, as some of you may have experienced that brings the whole network down. So uh, spanning true protocol is absolutely required to, uh, to prevent that. And in the case of uh, Sonos, um, there is always one device that is considered the root bridge. Now, when you set up a Sonos system, say you install that first connect amp, that first connect amp that you install and it's hardwired into the system, it natively becomes the root bridge. Okay. Uh, what we don't want is for the root bridge to get moved around. So it's unlikely, but it does happen occasionally that a customer may say, hey, I'm going to move that connect amp over you know, somewhere else. Uh, and then that connect amp still is the root bridge, but it's now become you know, a wireless piece, and that's obviously not desired because wireless is less reliable than a wired Ethernet connection. So uh, just be aware of that, that, um, you know, that root bridge, we definitely don't want it to, to move. There is a way to change the root bridge if you need to later on, but um, uh, the root bridge should always be a wired device. That's the, the lesson to learn here. And in uh, Spanish Tree, you know, we, we create that mesh network. Um, we disable the, uh, the interfaces where there are two paths, and we choose the least cost path uh, to get from 
uh, you know, whatever speaker, say point C, back to point A. So, uh, installing Sonos, there is a, uh, a document that we've actually created that's um, a great form that's uh, electronic that you can actually use uh, to uh, collect all of that data about the Sonos system. And the, the best part about this, quite honestly, is collecting the username and passwords because that's the, that's the one thing that always trips us up, right? It's like, it's not the technical thing, it's, the, uh, it's just getting the username and passwords and understanding you know, what those are so when we go to the app install, we're not um, waiting on a customer to respond or you know, having to issue reset passwords and all that. So being able to collect that upfront uh, will save you lots and lots of time. But additionally, you have uh, ways to you know, uh, identify what the names of the players are going to be. Uh, so it's den, kitchen, bedroom, lounge, you know, pool. I can document all that and then store this as a part of your overall system documentation. So uh, we have this available, um, you know, available from the uh, gentleman at AllNet uh, for distribution, and they can uh, you know, send that out to you. It's just a simple PDF, uh, but a great way to kind of organize your Sonos install to get started. So here's a scenario that I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, we have multiple Connect amps in a rack. Um, first off, placement of Connect amps um, is such that thermally, uh, you do not want them to touch their cases. So when they're installed two by two in a rack like this, uh, you do not want those aluminum cases to actually touch each other because they will act as a giant heat sink and essentially amplify the heat in each one. So maintain separation between both the Connect amps themselves as well as the rack uh, walls. Uh, and you will be fine. You can, however, stack them directly on top of each other. In this photo, they are actually on shelves, but uh, if you were to stack them on top of each other, that's okay. Uh, they are designed for ventilation in that case. Uh, you just don't want the cases to actually touch the, uh, the aluminum sections together. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the best practice when installing uh, Sonos in a rack is to hardwire each one uh, independently into a dedicated switch port. Okay. Uh, and if, if you can, you can go into an unmanaged switch and then you can uh, upstream as you see there in the photo on the right or the diagram on the right where you can upstream into your router. Uh, if they're on that unmanaged switch, that's going to give them full uh, access to each other. It prevents network loops and the switch or the router then is the trunk to the internet from that point forward. One thing that uh, you know I, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier was that you know I have installers that you know put a boost in every system. Uh, that's really convenient because yes, you have those you know 10 Connect amps in a rack, but then you know what if the customer says, hey, I want to get a Sonos One and put it in my hallway. Well, there's no Ethernet in the hallway, so now I could hang that wired boost off of that same switch, and it's going to provide a Sonos Net cloud that I can then add a wireless component to. So that could be that Sonos One that uh, just sits there in the hallway or the kitchen uh, and does not need Ethernet um, attached to it. And then the rest of the system is all, you know, in-ceiling speakers via the Connect amps. So that's a great way to kind of future-proof the installation. Uh, very low cost to do right at the front, um, and it's going to give you the uh, ability to add that Sonos or that wireless product later on. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, available that you can access today, uh, it's built into every Sonos product, is a diagnostics tool, okay? And the diagnostics tool is actually a great way for you to kind of double check um, your installation before you leave the home. And what it is, it's, uh, it's embedded into every player. Every player is essentially a Linux computer. Uh, but you can go to the IP address of the player, and if you need help finding the IP address of the player, you can actually do that via the Sonos app uh, if you go into advanced settings and about my system, uh, you will actually see the IP addresses of all the players, their MAC addresses and everything. And if you put the IP address of the player, you put in a uh, special URL uh, that's colon 1400 slash support slash review. Uh, you can actually pull up diagnostics of the entire system. So all of the zones, um, if you click on each of the zones, you will get a wealth of information about the particular player software versions, all that good stuff. This is a lot of the data that customer care gets when you submit a diagnostic, um, but this is all available to you in the field. So uh, you can actually pull up um, you know, data about the, uh, the players themselves, uh, you know, different uh, 
types of configuration options, software versions, uh, most important of which is what we call the network matrix. Uh, and the network matrix gives you a 30,000 foot view of the health of the Sonos Net network. So you will actually see uh, in a color coded design a grid that basically indicates the player signal strengths to each other. So for example, uh, looking on the left, I see the, the node that says uh, uh, CEW uh, left. So that's actually the left speaker of a stereo, spare, stereo pair. Uh, and I actually see that it is communicating, if I look over on the right, um, to the CEW right speaker. Okay. Uh, and I see some numbers there that say inbound and outbound. Those are the relative signal strengths. Uh, and then the, uh, the spinning tree state. So this is a great way to kind of identify if there's any potential issues because the color coding, green is good, uh, orange is okay, uh, red is bad. All right, so very simple to understand that if you have a couple red squares, you're gonna wanna investigate and understand that, hey, that may be a, uh, an interference issue or perhaps a range issue. Uh, so it gives us a, a really quick way of identifying where there may be issues in the system uh, before the customer calls us about it later. Uh, so the nice thing is, is that if you do make a change and say, hey, I, I need to change this to a different channel because it obviously is an interference uh, issue, uh, you change the, uh, the uh, wireless channel in the app, and then you can refresh the, uh, the diagnostics and you can say, oh, that, that red square is gone. Everything looks good now. Um, and so we're, we're rocking and rolling. So uh, definitely check this out. Um, again, the, um, the gentleman at AllNet will have uh, access to this document. We have a uh, a PDF that details how to read the numbers and how to understand uh, what the diagnostics tool is telling you. Uh, so a great way to uh, uh, alleviate potentially a call to customer care that you can kind of take care of in the field by just changing a wireless channel and perhaps moving a product uh, a couple of feet so it doesn't have so much interference. And lastly, uh, it does show uh, where the root bridge is. So if you have any doubt as to what is the root bridge or if you want to verify that it is that wired component, uh, then the root bridge uh, will be displayed in the diagnostics tool. Uh, and this, uh, again, is a, uh, if you have a situation where that root bridge needs to be changed, um, there is a, a special URL you can pass to the player uh, to change it to something else if you want to move a connecting up from one location to another. Uh, I'm sure most of you that have used Sonos have probably submitted diagnostics. Um, one thing that I think is really you know, helpful about this is that you can prevent a truck roll. Um, you know, if the customer calls you, they have issues. Uh, you could submit a diagnostic or have your customer do it and, uh, you know, themselves because it's in the app. It's under advanced settings. It's, it's readily available for them. It comes back with a seven digit number and then you can call customer care from wherever you are, your office, if you're on the road. Uh, at home, and basically you can get the uh, uh, you know, the opinion of the customer care agent to say, hey, this is what's going on. It's an interference issue, or looks like they have a uh, uh, you know a router that's uh, you know, not performing properly. Um, but they will be able to dig in and uh, give you at least some idea of what's going on with that customer. And perhaps it means that you don't have to do a truck roll, and you can diagnose it remotely, uh, or perhaps it's an issue just because of the way they're using their system or something, but you know they they can dig in and give you that data, so you're not going out, you know, uh, unarmed with uh, information about what's happening with the system. So a great way to uh, uh, potentially you know eliminate a truck roll and uh, and take care of getting something resolved uh, remotely. So submit that have your customer submit that diagnostic. They'll give you the seven digit number, and you can call into customer care with that number to uh, to get information. So uh, app. Uh, we're continuing to evolve our app. Uh, we always say that our app is the best way to control Sonos because of the search functionality, the overall you know, ability to organize and manage your content via Sonos uh, favorites and playlists. Um, you know, we had the My Sonos feature back in uh, December, which really gives you more and more control um, and power over how you organize your music, uh, whether it be radio stations or playlists or specific tracks. Uh, a great way to view and uh, you know exercise you know, the, the content that you listen to most. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, always educate your customers on, you know, our app. It's equally featured on iOS as well as Android. 
uh, and will give them the, the best overall experience, particularly when they use a search function to search for the content they're looking for. Uh, we do have a dedicated uh, Sonos customer support team. Um, we have digital support via Sonos.com. Uh, a very, very extensive knowledge base, um, lots and lots of great articles, very deeply uh, detailed technical articles, uh, particularly around networking, uh, interference, um, you know, setting up local libraries. If they have a NAS drive, they want to use their own content or if they want to do streaming, uh, you know, constantly being added to. So definitely uh, check that out. It's a vast resource, um, you know, for technical information. Uh, as well as social media support via Facebook Messenger, Twitter, uh, email support, and then also uh, uh, telephone support that is Monday through Friday, uh, 9 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We have teams that are based in uh, uh, Boston and Santa Barbara uh, that will handle questions, and we're continually to uh, add uh, resources to our customer care. Uh, but as always, uh, you know, certainly let us know if you know if there's uh, Things that need to be escalated, uh, you know, we'll certainly you know, assist you in the best way we can. Okay, so uh, lots of content there, I know, uh, in a short amount of time, but uh, so this is a home sound system, uh, giving you all your music everywhere. Human control via voice, app control, hard button control, uh, and sound you can feel um, that really is going to give your customers the best experience. So. Uh, we'll definitely uh, stay on the line here. Uh, you know, Rick uh, was going to take some questions, um, so happy to stay on the line here to uh, answer those. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that Allnet uh, has all the resources that I discussed there in terms of the documentation, the diagnostics tool, uh, the uh, uh, you know the particular technical information, and um, you know system startup sheets that you can use to uh, document your system and and any other. Uh, you know, technical resources will make sure that they have access to all those and you can certainly request those. Cool. Okay, Matt, we do have some questions that came through. Absolutely. So we have a couple on voice control and then we have a couple on airplay okay. and then we have some comments about the diagnostics and the uh, client survey and setup documents. So okay. I'm just, since the comments have been coming through, I'm just going to go ahead and send everyone on the call uh, a copy of those documents so that way everyone has them. Um, and uh, the question that came through, uh, let's I guess start with uh, the voice control. So Matt asks if we're going to be able to group zones using voice commands. Uh, I believe that is on the roadmap that uh, uh, we're continuing okay. to add functionality. Uh, for additional, you know, Sonos specific um, operations. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Um, definitely something that has been a big request. Uh, but yeah, the, the voice is always a, a picture in time. Um, you know, what's there today will not be there. I mean, there'll be more there, um, you know, in the next couple of months. So lots of uh, additional things you know, are planned for voice control with Sonos, additional, you know, commands and features. And, and so forth. So that definitely is uh, certainly a, a very large request. And I think that that mirrors the experience with every other vendor. Voice control is only getting better and better as uh, people have time to use these skills and then we can give feedback and they can be refined. So, and I like the fact that Sonos is um, constantly improving these products. This, uh, some of the other questions that came in are about airplay. That kind of totally blew me away. Um, that that's just, yeah, it just works now. Um, okay, so the other question that came in, well, two more questions about voice control. Um, I don't know if this is a something you're going to want to be able to answer at all. Um, Sonos speakers having Alexa, is that is that a move for the full line to have Alexa control or Alexa capability internal? Well, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that, you know, we will have uh, um, additional, you know, emphasis on voice and in, in future, you know, products. So that would be, uh, I think that's a given. Um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, Alexa is a, uh, you know, today we have the ability to operate, you know, even 
non microphone enabled Sonos products via Alexa. So you don't have to have a Sonos one or a beam to use Alexa with Sonos. You can use an echo or a dot and, you know, use Alexa with Sonos. So, um, even our older products, you know, connect and connect amp can be controlled via Alexa. Uh, you just have, have have to have a microphone enabled device. And so whether that's a Sonos one or a beam or a, uh, or an echo or a dot, that, that capability exists today. Um, and so, you know, we anticipate, you know, this similar, uh, strategy going forward is that, um, you know, we would have, uh, you know, seamless control across, you know, the entire product line, whether it, uh, has microphones or not. Okay. So hopefully that addresses your question, Randy. Um, and again, to clarify, to reiterate Matt's point, the, the, the beam and the Sonos one are the only current products with microphone arrays at all. So otherwise, uh, an Echo or a Dot or some other uh, Google Home or whatever would have to be used once the yeah. Google, you know, the Google integration is uh, announced. You talked about, you spoke about that earlier, so I'm not like speaking yes. out of class here. No, uh, not at all. Okay. I mean, that's, okay. That Google is, uh, absolutely, that, that development is underway. Okay, perfect. All right. So the last question about uh, voice control is that now that the, Beam has an HDMI connection, and you talked about CEC. Is the CEC going to have any role in uh, control over the displays that the, the beams are connected to? Uh, yes, today that uh, is a you know it can control the the power state uh, of that display. Um, you know as long as it's connected via that HDMI R connection, uh, which is the only two way interface. So you have to have it into an HDMI R compatible port on the display. Uh, but yes, it, it okay. does have that, um, and that was, you know, kind of like the scenario in which you have a, uh, a fire TV on that display and you say, watch Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, we go from a powered off state to, you know, fully playing the movie, uh, you know, power on of the TV, you know, correct input and, you know, activation of the, uh, of the stream of the movie stream on the fire TV, all from that one voice command. So that's all happening via CEC. Uh, and Alexa uh, integration with the Fire TV. Okay, so uh, Kyle has a follow-up question about voice control. If the client does not want voice control, but they still want to use a beam just because of the size, form factor, the price point, et cetera, is there a way to permanently disable the voice control so that the button on the top won't yes. accidentally toggle it back on? Yes, I, that's a, a, a very good question. I, I should have brought that up in the presentation, but that's a really good question. So we are as concerned about you know customer privacy as anyone, and we certainly you know stepped into this whole voice uh, arena you know with the understanding that there would be customers that simply did not want you know uh, a device listening you know 24/7 on their on their in their household. And so two things that we did. One is is that uh, if you do not add the credentials, okay for the Alexa integration, when you do the initial setup of a Beam or a Sonos One, uh, then that microphone never gets activated, okay? Um, it absolutely will not do anything. It will not be listening. It's, you know, it's not activated at all. And on the top of the Sonos One and the Beam, there is the mute button for the microphone, okay? And so there's a little LED uh, that's placed right by that, uh, that mute button. And if that LED is unlit, okay, then that microphone is physically hardwired to the LED. So there's no way that the, you know, the microphone is even physically capable of listening to anything. So effectively, what you're describing is permanently disabled. That's permanently disabled because it's, it's, it's a physical connection. There is no way that the LED can be on and the microphone listening. So we designed that circuit that way so it cannot be software you know, hacked or re-engineered. Uh, you see a lot of stories about webcams, you know, taking video even though the, uh, the LED is off. Uh, that's because they're software controlled. And we designed that in such a way that uh, uh, we can give customers full confidence that um, if the LED is off, then it is not listening. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, the next question, uh, going back to AirPlay V2, so AirPlay V2, you said that is uh, that's happening in the the Sonos update that's happening this week. Yes, uh, it should be going out today. As a matter of fact. Oh, perfect. Okay. And 
you mentioned the Sonos One, the Beam, the Play Bar, and the Play 5 Gen 2 are the current models that are available Play. to uh, AirPlay into. And Play. then you Play. also mentioned, and the, oh, I mentioned, oh, yes. So Sonos One, Beam, Play Bass, and Play 5 Gen 2. Correct. Not not Play Bar. So starting from. Oh, not Play Bar. Okay. Yeah, Play 5 Gen 2, Play Bass, Sonos One. Those are the ones. That okay, so here's a question. So you mentioned the scenario if you wanted to share that content throughout the house or to another speaker, you could group zones through the app or whatever. Yes. Um, is there a way to do that without playing the audio on the first device? Let's say, you know, like um, one of the children in the in the household wants to airplay, but the device in their room, let's say it's an old a Play Three or a Play One or any other device it doesn't have airplay how what's the best way for them to get that audio to their room and then either turn down or or yeah, whatever the, the the first speaker that they have to go into yes yeah, so they they can turn down that first speaker okay and so they just group it and then turn it right. down and then it's not available for anyone else to use until they ungroup right okay and then it it becomes by by proxy the uh you know the the other speaker becomes AirPlay compatible by proxy of the, the compatible one. Okay. And at that point, it's just a shared source like any other line input on any Sonos product like we've been doing since day one. Right. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so the next question is, Is will the Boost have that? Will the Boost ever have that functionality or one of the non-speaker devices have that functionality where we can just go in and... Uh, AirPlay into uh, a common item that's that's wired to every other speaker. Uh, today, no. I mean, today it's it's um, yeah. The, the boost is okay. I mean, not involved in the audio streams um, at all. It's simply okay. there as an extension product, um, and, and it does not handle any any uh, you know, audio input or output or you know, functionality like that. Uh, no, there. Yeah, okay. Um, so is it a hardware limitation or is a software limitation for the Connect and the Connect amps with AirPlay? We've been asked here on the chat box. It's, it's hardware. Um, the uh, okay. Apple requires specific authentication hardware uh, that needs to be in, in the products to allow uh, AirPlay V2 as part of their certification. So. Uh, you'll notice on, um, you know, when when you begin to get your beams, you'll notice that there is a AirPlay certification, um, you know, logo on the on the box itself, and that's because we had to go through a rigorous uh, process with Apple to make sure that we were AirPlay certified. So, uh, older oh, products, no. simply, yeah, older products simply don't have that hardware. Okay, so Kyle, to answer your question, if you've got homes with a lot of connects and connect amps, um, it talk to them about a play five gen two or a beam or a, a play base or a sonos one um a sonos one uh, daniel can, a sonos one can make yeah, a lot of uh, because you could put it in the middle of the home you know and it becomes a, a a voice gateway as well as you know an airplane gateway perfect okay uh daniel yes this webinar is recorded and we will uh, share that link with you so you can share it with other members of your staff uh, who were not able to attend the live event. Um, okay, the next question. Uh, Kyle is asking specifically about a Wi-Fi brand that we sell, um, Eero. Uh, does Sonos work well with Eero? So Matt, I'll, you're, I would love to hear your opinion and then I can share some of experiences from our side as well. Uh, I don't have a, a, a ton of personal experience with it. Um, it's more anecdotally what I've what I've heard. Um, we have you know a good relationship with Eero. Um, we certainly have you know engineers that consult with each other. Uh, in fact, one of our former trainers actually is our national training manager now. So we do have a, a, a good relationship with Eero. Uh, certainly, we respect the, the architecture because it's basically what Sonos Net uh, has been for the last ten years. Um, I do know just hearing anecdotally from you know, our customer care team is that there are you know, scenarios in which um, you know, we just need to be careful about how 
computer was set up um, in its various modes uh, that you know will work best with Sonos. So uh, I believe they do have some you know, technical articles um, you know that describe some some different scenarios um, and configuration options um, on Hero that um, you know will make for a fluid, seamless experience. Uh, but they they are. I assure you that customer care is fully briefed on on Hero and is very knowledgeable about the product, and they understand, you know, the different scenarios where it uh, comes into play with its, you know, its mesh uh, networking design and so forth. And so, uh, you know, I, I know there's a, a couple of different um, technical articles and uh, scenarios in which they've been able to uh, to address um, in cooperation with Hero as, as well. So uh, there is dialogue between the two companies about what's you know, what's best and what isn't supportive, what is, and, and so forth. So uh, that's that's what I've heard, but I, I I can't give you any personal experience because I just have, have not had the product in my home. Okay. From our side, um, our Eero trainer is Paul, and Paul has uh, over a dozen Sonos devices in his house, and he obviously is using Eero exclusively for his uh, for his internet rig or for his network rig. So. What I was told is that um, set your Sonos devices, specifically if you have a Sonos Net as well, set it on the highest possible channel, so channel 11 on the 2.4, because the Eero defaults to the low channels and Eero auto scans, so it, but it always auto scans starting at the lowest channels. So if it's constantly looking for its own pathways and Sonos Net is doing its thing, if you set your Sonos Net on the highest possible channel, then you'll have the least possibility for interference between the, the Eero side and the Sonos side in the same home. Um, and then obviously, you know, hardwiring is best and there's a two port switch on every Eero. Uh, let me see, next question. So uh, Jim is asking about multiple racks. So if you've got a switch in each rack, what is the best practice for uh, hardwired device, hardwired connect and or connect amps and racks when there's multiple racks and possibly multiple racks in, the, in different locations on the same property? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, essentially, I mean, if you were using that scenario, um, which sounds you know, fairly complex, I would, I would venture to guess that you may be using uh, managed switches. In which case, you know, as long as we follow that recommendation of enabling spanning tree protocol on each uh, switch that a Sonos device is hardwired into, then you should be, um, you know, clear across multiple switches. So if you had a you know, switch in the main lower level, uh, and then perhaps you had one in a utility room on the second floor in its trunk, um, you know, via you know, one Ethernet connection up to the uh, up to the second floor, uh, and then you had you know additional Sonos devices um, hardwired into the switch upstairs. Uh, as long as SDP is enabled on both of those, then it will pass. Um, you know the Sonos speakers will be able to uh, to pass their uh, you know their individual states and path information you know amongst each other. Uh, we just wouldn't want a situation where you have a um, uh, you know one enabled with SDP and the other one not. Then you could definitely create a network loop. Uh, if if you weren't using managed switches and you're using unmanaged, then you really don't have to worry about anything because it's going to pass the that information transparently from switch to switch. So, you know, you would hardwire your your lower level players uh, into the master switch, and then you have a trunk line going to the uh, the remote switch, and then you can hardwire additional players into the remote switch, and it will work fine. Uh, we've used that similar type of scenario, like at CD events, where we may have, you know, a master switch that handles all the in ceiling and in wall stuff, uh, and then we're doing, you know, other standalone players um, just for reliability because of CD being not a very you know, friendly wireless environment. Uh, we'll have remote switches that might, you know, tag into a play bar or something like that, and um, and they work absolutely. We use Luxel in that scenario, but uh, it worked totally fine. Uh, the SDP passed from switch to switch, and it was all good. Perfect. Okay. And Jim, if you don't like cascading switches, contact us because we've got stackable switches that you can connect through SFP uh, using fiber, and then it all behaves like one big switch anyway. So yep. we, we've got multiple ways to skin this cat. Okay. Um, the next question. 
Oh, I skipped through here. We talked about the Connect and the Connect amp not being compatible with AirPlay because it's the hardware. Uh, so Joe's got a question that wants to do. He wants to use external amps with a Connect, and he wants to know. Oh, this is more. This is an old school audio question. So the line output of a Connect. Um, how many? Um, how many amps can one a single Sonos Connect drive? Uh. You want me to tackle it? Yeah. yeah I, I, okay. I I so, it. Joe, you use a, a product called the distribution amp. You use a line level distribution amp, and then uh, you can take one uh, left right audio output and split that up into it's either six or eight. So, we've got um, a couple different companies that make them. Um, also, check your amplifier to see if it has a bus input. So, you might be able to go into a single input and then through software or toggle switches or depending upon the models of the amplifier, these multi-channel amplifiers a lot of times will allow you to take a single input and then bust that across uh, multiple channels. So it's a, it's specific to each um, multi-zone amplifier that you're using. And if you, if you need help with that, uh, give us a call and it will be happy or either, you know, contact your, if, in this case you said speakercraft, but, uh, either their tech support can walk you through it or give us a call and we'll help you with it. Okay. And Joe replies, he says his amp does have the bus input. I think we're good, Joe. Just give me a call if you need help with this. Okay. I think that's it for, for Q&A. Awesome. All right. Very good. So any um, final comments, Matt? No, I, uh, I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, uh, Really, really happy about the beam. I know, uh, Rick, maybe you can add your comments about what your experience was. Um, I gave these guys a, a not a super long demo, but uh, but enough of a demo that I think they were pretty amazed by how much sound came out of a, a compact form factor. So uh, they will definitely have um, you know one on display within the next couple of weeks, and uh, uh, it does officially launch on July 17th, uh, and uh, so we're not far away. Um, but start thinking about you know applications for it because it can be an upsell opportunity in those auxiliary rooms where you know you may not have been touching them before and now you have a way to uh, to really you know give customers an awesome experience in those uh, you know auxiliary rooms where uh, you know, where, where uh, you know they have those smaller TVs and uh, they're going to have great sound without having to uh, you know overpower it with a play bar or uh, you know or a solution that just isn't seamless so uh, I think you'll find it's yeah. a great product for that. I would absolutely agree with that. So I, when I heard this thing, it really punches above its weight. It sounds really good. It has really good bass, even without being paired to the sub. In fact, we were listening to it at kind of a medium volume level. And I looked over at Matt and I said, did you already pair that with our sub? Because we had a, a, a play bar with the sub in that same space. And we moved the play bar so that Matt could demo the, the beam. And I, and I asked if he had paired it with the sub because it sounded really good. So when you turn it up, uh, you definitely notice that it, it, it's not a play bar, but at lower levels, it certainly has the same sonic signature. It sounds as good as a play bar at lower levels. So, um, yep. you know, it's just like any other, you know, high quality speaker, the, the little brother, has the same sound, it just doesn't play as loud or as low necessarily. Um, and to Matt's point, you know, this is absolutely perfect for uh, master bedrooms or like the guest bedrooms or the kids' room or something like that because people are always putting in these 55s and these TVs are at a, they're, you know, the price points are lower and lower each each year, it seems like. And it's hard to sell a $700 sound bar with a $600 TV, but the price point of the beam just, it, it slides right in. So I think we're going to see, it's not going to be a replacement. Uh, it's not going to replace other sound bars that you're already selling. It's going to be supplemental. You're going to have more rooms of Sonos in these homes, which is always a good thing. So, um, Daniel, yes. Uh, Daniel's coming down for one of our uh, trainings in the branch. So um, 
we've been told that our our uh, inventory as well as our uh, showroom units are shipping. If they haven't shipped today, then they're shipping any day. Matt, when do you expect this product to be on the street? Uh, officially July 17th. It'll be on the street, sold in all channels. Um, I believe, okay. yeah, you guys should have product ready to roll by that date. Um, but I won't. Yeah, I didn't know what I was allowed to say, but yeah, I think uh, Wally sent out an email that our product is either on the road or or uh, on its way. So um, if any of you have uh, some pre-orders to place, go ahead and get them in because th I can tell this product's going to be on uh, allocation at all net. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, if you've got uh, customers that are waiting for this type of thing, let us know and we'll make sure you get your product shipped in the first wave. All right. I think that's, uh, that's it for us today, Matt. So Absolutely great presentation, and thank you for sticking around for the Q&A and uh, addressing all, the, all of these questions. So if anyone has any, if anyone has any uh, follow-up, um, again, my uh, email is rick.murphy at allnetdistributing.com. I'm happy to, uh, to help. So thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar today. We're going to go ahead and close the webinar now.